I was really interested in autism and and I was drawn to it because I, I study social behavior and autism is characterized by core social impairments. And so as I'm not a clinician, so I came to the field as a neuroscientist and as an outsider, you can be a little disruptive, right? You can start asking questions. And so we didn't understand the disease biology. And so in cancer, you pull out the tumor and you profile the, um, the cancer cells, and then you can create precision immunotherapies, right? And so I was interested in doing that for autism. And autism is a brain disorder. And most of the efforts that people had been engaged in were looking for these biomarkers, so molecules that are markers of a disease, and they've been looking in blood. And so if you look over um, at neurology, in the diagnostic space for MS, for various forms of dementia, people have been looking in a fluid called cerebral spinal fluid, which bathes the brain in the spinal column. And so I wanted to start efforts in autism to borrow a page out of neurology's playbook to ask, can we see a signature of autism in the spinal fluid, which is has biochemistry that's more representative of the brain than the blood. Cerebrospinal fluid, that was a, a big breakthrough. Um, maybe that came partly because you had this cross-disciplinary background, but clinicians probably would not have thought, uh, autism clinicians would not have thought about going and collecting cerebrospinal fluid. It sounds like very hard work um, that has to come from what, a lumbar puncture? Yeah, it comes from a lumbar puncture. And so initially when I started asking about, well, I would like to ask, access spinal fluid, and I said, you know, people said, well, we don't do that in autism. And I said, well, what are the clinical indications for collecting spinal fluid? And so what I did is I went around to, um, I think people in the in my department who are clinicians call me tenacious, right? And so <laughs> I'm sure that that's, that's clinical speak for something else. <laughs> but um, I went around and I met every clinician I knew. And so I kind of worked my network and we were able, so when there was a clinical indication for collecting spinal fluid, um, we would just collect a little bit more for research purposes. And so we were able to do this real first proof of concept study and we were able to show um, that there was this marker that's associated with social functioning um, and that it was really diminished in these kids with autism. And so, um, and then we've since replicated that in a variety of cohorts, but that was really where we started getting the traction. Yeah, you say tenacious, I think that's the definition of an entrepreneur. Yes, exactly. Someone once said that, the, that for them an entrepreneur is someone who sets goals without regard to the resources currently available. And you went out and made it happen. I did, yeah. And, and poverty funding was hard to find in those early days too because it wasn't something that you could apply for an NIH grant for. No, nobody would fund it. And this was one of those things, I, I so firmly believed in the idea and it was actually due to early philanthropy that I was able to do these studies. And so there were family stakeholders who really cared about autism or cared about child health. Um, so I got money from philanthropists and then Stanford has, um, philanthropists will donate to specific programs at Stanford, so there's a multi um, across biological disciplinaries called BioX, and so I received money from BioX, and I received money from the Maternal Child Health Research Institute, which again was philanthropically funneled into the institute, and you wrote proposals. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was way too high risk and too crazy for the typical funding agencies. So is that one of the reasons why when Laura came to you and asked you to be involved with Brain Mind, you saw value in this kind of conference. I'm sure you go to a lot of conferences. How yeah. how is this conference different? Yeah, I think well I mean I think living in Silicon Valley, you see all these people dreaming up new technologies, right? That you know we didn't even know we needed. And I think that's very much a similar spirit in academics at Stanford where you think, wow, here's this really tricky problem and I'm going to dream up a solution. And so for me, even if the industry might be different, if it's a venture capitalist, if it's everybody sees the need to create something that doesn't exist. And so for me, there was a lot of like-minded individuals and there's a, a real energy and creativity and a sense of we need to get things done and there's an urgency to getting it done. And it's not clear that leadership is coming from our government anymore. And so for us, I think there's really this grassroots you know, with these partnerships between industry and academics that we could make things happen. How is that action 
played out through the ecosystem over uh, over the times when the conference wasn't in session. So I've done an event like um, there was an event at Indie Bio, and so I went and I was asked by Michael McCullough and Sean O'Sullivan to come and give a talk about essentially disruptive philanthropy. And so I um, basically, you know, educated people about how absolutely broken the academic funding model is. And there were a lot of people in the audience who came up to me later and said, I had no idea that scientists, you know, spend I actually think it's way more than 50% of their time, especially in elite medical schools where you have to fund everything, um, that we spend so much of our time fundraising. And so I feel like there's been these Michael McCullough's had salons at his house where you would you know, have a fireside chat with different people. And so I feel like it's really spilled over. I've formed relationships with people. I stay in touch with them. We've started initiatives or started groups to think about um, certain topics. It's easy to just pay lip service and say, that the, the NIH is broken and the amount of time um, researchers have to spend writing proposals is too long. But on the other hand, they they have to have a process to allocate funds and all, it wouldn't work to have a world where everyone deserving got money. Mm -hmm. And and it's really hard for a government to, to find a process to fairly allocate their capital. Um, it seems like BrainMind is one new model to try to bring more of a venture capital uh, type energy into the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is any of that feeding back into NIH? Or is any, are there any ways in which the fact that the organizations like BrainMind are doing this now is having an influence on other sectors? I think there are people at BrainMind who are beginning to think that they are high net worth individuals and there are things that they really care about. And so there's a guy named Jim Simons who runs Renaissance Technologies. Um, he's a billionaire and he started the Simons Foundation. And he has been funding very high risk, high reward work um, for autism. And you know, you submit the grant and you don't have to wait two years to get the funding with a 20% budget cut. You get the money in four to six months. And your, your grant application is in 100 pages it's maybe total of 20, you know, and so he really has streamlined the process. And I've spoken with other people here who are either investors or philanthropists and every, you know, people were saying, well, wow, I'm affected by Alzheimer's disease. I really care about that. And I met a gentleman here who had started a foundation to do just that. And so what I'm hoping is that there will be talks that resonate with people that have capacity and they think, wow, this isn't moving fast enough. And, you know, my dad died of dementia. If I weren't doing autism work, I would absolutely be working on Alzheimer's. And I think you see what happens in your personal life and you think, what resonates with me and how am I gonna make a difference? So my hope is that there's people at Brain Mind that are hearing a talk that sparks something in them and they think, wow, this isn't happening fast enough. I saw my dad die of this disease. I don't want, you know, to see it in my spouse or me or one of my children. Yeah, that's a great point because that that need, that feeling of wanting to do something was there for a lot of these philanthropists, yeah. but there wasn't a vehicle for them to see a direct action. The only way they could have impact is to write a check to a university or to a disease foundation. And now they're starting to see projects where they can say, my contribution can actually make the difference of this. This wouldn't happen were it not for my contribution. Exactly. And that's why we created this research translator accelerator program, which yesterday we had kind of a research, um, an RFA for um, proposals. And so we had people in our department, and this is in partnership with Brain Mind, um, come up with things that we thought we're, you know, and I think sometimes on the on the venture side or the philanthropy side, some of this stuff feels so pie in the sky. Like, how is this actually going to help this disease? And people might be a little skeptical. And so we created this program where we had either filed patents or were close to filing patents, or we had things that were very commercially ready. And so we gave, you know, three of us gave talks. I gave one on autism. Um, there were two other talks, one on um, eating disorders, one on a wearable device to measure brain activity in the wild. And I think that there was, it really um, impacted a lot of people because they thought, wow. And I had multiple people come up to me and say, wow, I can actually see this out in the world. And so I think that's maybe another way to start connecting is, is um, curating some of this content that will really impact the people that we're speaking to. How do you see the world being different five, 10, 20 years from now? 
Well, I mean, my hope is that we don't have autism. You know, my hope is that we can detect it early enough. And what we know is that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of micro social events every day. And if you think about a baby that's developing and you don't get autism diagnosed until four years of age, if we could di diagnose you in spinal fluid before you were behaviorally symptomatic and we could have these behavioral interventions that we know can be efficacious, while you're still making con eye contact, while you still maybe have the social smile, that maybe we could make it so autism doesn't happen to begin with.